my darlings welcome back uh, I hope you all are having a great week on either Wednesday or Thursday whenever you're watching this uh, this will be doing chapter 11 today and other than the worksheet and these videos that'll be it for the rest of the week except your commonplace book prompts just make sure those are in by Friday at 1230 uh, most of you did a great job on the quiz thank you for working hard on that uh, and as you can probably tell, we are nearing the end. We will be finishing up uh, the last three chapters, including this one, uh, over the next week. We'll finish up the final bits of the book next week. So, uh, let's turn to chapter 11. Pretty dramatic chapter, if you've read, as you probably remember from reading it. So chapter 11 starts for us on page 152. Uh, and remember that we left Jean at the end of chapter 10 escaping from Leper, escaping from Vermont, escaping from this reality that has come crashing down on him, that the war is really real, and not only is the war really real, but it is so real that it can in fact take this sort of innocent, childish soul like Leper and turn him literally insane. And so we see in chapter 10 this sort of turning point for Gene, this moment where he has to face, he comes face to face with reality. And in chapter 11 here, we're going to see, of course, the climax of the novel. Everything is going to come to a head here in chapter 11. And it is quite a dramatic chapter, as we see. So Gene knows when he runs from Leper, when he runs from Vermont, that he is running towards something. And we see this in the very first sentences of the chapter. I wanted to see Phineas and Phineas only. With him there was no conflict except between athletes, something Greek inspired and Olympian in which victory would go to whoever was the strongest in body and heart. This was the only conflict he had ever believed in. So again this idea that Phineas like the Greek god Apollo, represents light, represents truth, represents honor, represents all of this, these sort of ideals that he does not fall under the category of the brutal war that Jean has just experienced through Leper's eyes. And also, of course, that Phineas is the one person who could have sympathy and understanding for Leper's situation because Phineas is the one other member of their class who has suffered as well. And Jean finds Finney, uh, no surprise, in the middle of a snowball fight when he returns to Devon. And he says on page 153 in the middle of the page, this gathering had obviously been Finney's work. Who else could have put this together? The lights and leaders of the senior class pasting each other with snowballs. And so Jean gets dragged into the snowball fight as well. Finney stops to ask about Leper, but Jean doesn't tell him because now is not the right time. And so they end the day with this rather uh, very fun and amusing snowball fight. And then on page 155, Jean tells us when they get back to the dorms, hours later he has a realization that Finney sh probably shouldn't be doing snowball fights at all. And Finney says something that because we've read to the end of the chapter we know is pretty major foreshadowing. He says, Stan Pohl said something about not falling again, but I'm very careful. Christ, don't break it again. We see real feeling, real emotion here from Jean. No, no, of course I won't break it again. Isn't the bone supposed to be stronger when it grows together over a place where it's been broken once? In fact, I think I can feel it getting stronger. And so we see here, again, Finney sort of imagining the world as it should be oh, I don't really have to worry about it because my leg is actually growing back stronger. And isn't that the reality? When something breaks and comes back together, it's stronger than before. And of course, we also get a symbolic reading of this passage here where Finney is not just talking about his leg, but talking about the friendship between himself and Jean. This idea that even though their friendship was broken by Jean's betrayal, that it has come back stronger than ever. But again, we have to remember always that Finney sees the world as it should be, not as it really is. And so Jean says, oh, you think you can? Can you feel it? Finney says, yes, I think so. And Jean says, thank God. Finney says, what? I, I said, that's good. Yes, I guess it is. 
This idea, this true emotion that Jean shows here, thank God that Finney's leg would be growing back stronger than it was before, shows us again the guilt that Jean is feeling over this. And the idea that if Finney's leg came back stronger, it would actually undo what Jean had done, that he would no longer have to feel guilt over Finney's fall from the tree. So they, uh, after dinner, Brinker comes to their room um, to ask about Leper on page 156 and 157. Um, and we see here from Jean, he tells us about two-thirds of the way down the page, he says, by now I no longer needed this vivid false identity. He talks about how he sort of used to put on this image of being from the Old South. Now I was acquiring, I felt, a sense of my own real authority and worth. I had had many new experiences, and I was growing up. So we talked back at the beginning about how this is a novel of maturity, a novel of growing up. We had that great word um, that hopefully, if you didn't remember for your first quiz, you do remember now. Uh, Buildings Roman, this genre of literature that is about growing up. And we said that these Buildings Romans um, are novels of growth, um, but that always with growing up there comes a loss of innocence, um, the, of, and it's a real loss. And in fact, uh, many of you are probably experiencing that loss of innocence now yourselves. You should be in the final weeks of your eighth grade year. You should be getting ready for your final exams, getting ready to go to Washington, D.C., getting ready to spend a summer doing whatever you want to do, going wherever you want to go, not, in, not having to worry about whether you can go to a friend's house or not. And what you all are experiencing is the fact that you are growing up faster than you should because the world around you is forcing you to. You are being forced to become an adult more quickly than you would have otherwise. And that's because you are feeling the loss of a peaceful world, a world where you don't have to worry about what is going on around you and whether you can go over to your friend or your family member's house or not. And so that loss is also what Jean and Finney are gonna experience and the rest of the Devon boys are going to experience very similar losses as well. Although as we'll see, theirs is a bit more visceral. So Breaker comes in and says, how's Leper? And Finney says, yeah, yeah, I meant to ask you before. And Jean starts out, Leper, why he's, he's on leave. Remember, Jean probably thinks it's not a great idea to say this in front of Brinker. Brinker always kind of, kind of makes fun of Leper. But Jean says in the same moment, but my resentment against having to mislead people seem to be growing stronger every day. As a matter of fact, Leper is absent without leave. He just took off by himself. So we see uh, real honesty here from Jean. He doesn't want to lie anymore. And in this honesty, we see Jean's growth. We see his maturity. He's not going to lie about what happened to Leper. And so they continue this discussion trying to figure out why. On page 157, Brinker says, He must be out of his mind, said Brinker energetically, to do a thing like that. I'll bet he cracked up, didn't he? That's what happened. Remember, Brinker always wants to know what's the truth, what's the truth. And he looks at Jean and he says, didn't it? That's exactly what happened. Yes, it did. Brinker had closed with such energy, almost enthusiasm on the truth, that I gave it to him without many misgivings. The moment he had it, he crumpled. Well, I'll be damned. I'll be damned. Old leper, quiet old leper, quiet old leper from Vermont. He never could fight worth a damn. You'd think somebody would have realized that when he tried to enlist. Poor old leper, what's he act like? He cries a lot of the time. Oh God, what's the matter? All right, so here we're seeing a very key moment of Brinker's character here. And this, of course, is also major foreshadowing for the end of the chapter. But this idea that Brinker pursues the truth, no matter the cost, Brinker wants to know what the truth is. But when Brinker gets a truth, here he realizes that it's more horrible to know the truth than to not know the truth. And so he is broken by the fact that he receives this horrible truth. He pursues it and pursues it and pursues it 
until he finally gets this horrible knowledge and then he doesn't want it anymore. Then all it brings is sorrow and pain. But this is major foreshadowing for what Brinker is going to do at the end of the chapter. So they continue the conversation about how there are now two members of their class that are out of the war. Jean uh, doesn't know what they're talking about. And then Brinker says, well, Finney, of course. And Jean says, oh, there's nothing. That's not true. He, of course he's still in the war. There's nothing to be out of anyways. The war doesn't even exist. Because remember that Jean, if Finney is out of the war because of his broken leg, it is Jean's fault. Jean is culpable for this. And so Finney, in response on page 158, says, sure, there isn't any war. It was one of the few ironic remarks Phineas ever made, and with it he quietly brought to a close all his special inventions which had carried us through the winter. Now the facts were reestablished, and gone were all the fantasies, closed before they had ever been opened. So with this ironic, with this sarcastic remark, sure, there isn't any war, we see that Finney knows that there really is a war. And this reality that he's been building has just been an illusion over and over and again. And with Finney's admitting that the war really does exist, we see this separate peace, this illusion of joy and happiness in this world that Finney has created come to an end. And we see finally the end of the second summer that Jean and Finney have been experiencing during the winter session at Devon while they've been playing at Olympic training and winter carnival games that in fact underneath it all is the truth that the war really does exist. And so we're going to see more in the next video. See you then.